The campaign for Black Ops Cold War, the hunt for Perseus, starts and ends in 1981. However, as per the canon ending, Perseus' plan to detonate the nuclear bombs from Operation Greenlight is prevented by the CIA. Multiplayer continues the story of Cold War in the year 1982 through 1984, as Perseus is on the move again. Through the multiplayer cinematic, the story behind the 13 operators of NAVO and the Warsaw Pact, I will tell you how the story of Cold War continues in multiplayer. And there is some interesting stuff here. Given that the multiplayer directly continues the story of Cold War, this video will contain spoilers from the campaign. You have hereby been warned. Perseus, today we reshape the world. Yeah, thanks. You got it. Start it up. Commencing exercise, injecting radar sequence. For decades we fought to keep communist aggression in check. After two years in the shadows, Chatter's Perseus is about to make another move. We don't know where or when, but we know it'll be big. Our motherland is led by cowards and weaklings. In time, the Americans and their NATO puppets will bring the Soviet Union to its knees. We will break this stalemate, then burn them both to the ground. The Soviets claim Perseus is a rogue element, a threat to us all. Stay vigilant. They never tell the whole truth. Launch control. Sir? Yes, sir. Code word launch authority is confirmed. Awaiting your go order. They sleep soundly at night, knowing they put on a good parade. But they lack the will to do what must be done. out and put him down. The superpowers will fall, victims of their own greed and corruption. We will rebuild Greater Russia from the ashes. Forget the standard rules of engagement. If we're gonna stop him, we're gonna have to get our hands dirty. Stand out. This concludes the exercise. Perseus sends the regards. The multiplayer of Black Ops Cold War is set in 1982 and 1983, or in the case of Nuketown, 1984, one to two years after the campaign. Adler's team, including Bell, prevented Perseus' plan to detonate nuclear bombs underneath every major city in Europe. Although as Perseus and the Cold War continued, tension rose between two warring factions, NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Where NATO was an alliance between mostly Western forces like the CIA and MI6, the Warsaw Pact was a collective defense treaty between the Soviet Union and other Eastern Bloc countries like Poland. On November 9, 1983, after two years of proxy wars in locations around the world like Armada in international waters, Miami and Angola, Perseus is on the move again. A small but obviously highly trained squad of Perseus sleeper agents infiltrates the Cheyenne mountain complex in Colorado and in what was supposed to be an exercise launches a nuclear bomb. The 
Born in 1937, Russell Adler has become a mystery even to those who have worked by his side for years. His history before joining the CIA in 1966 is only known to a few within Langley. In 1967, Adler was assigned to the MECV SOG unit in Vietnam, investing covert Soviet activity. Adler is a mysterious CIA operative called in for some of the most difficult assignments. He's a black box, even to some of his closest associates. After Vietnam, Adler disappeared from the CIA records, but continued to be affiliated with a number of clandestine operations. He possesses a cold confidence that commands the room. He rarely smiles, but maintains a biting dry wit. Capable of switching between disarming charisma and emotionless brutality in an instant, Adler enjoys intimidating those around him and excels at it. His deep knowledge of covert tactics, fluency in Russian and German, and mastery of espionage make him one of the few key operatives that the CIA can consistently rely upon. On January 13th, 1981, during a mission with Alex Mason and Frank Woods in Turkey, Adler discovered the Soviet agent Perseus became active and four days later Jason Hudson tasked Adler to build a team to track down and eliminate Perseus. The events after January 13, 1981 continue in a campaign, which I'm not talking about in this video for the sake of time. Reluctantly following in his father's footsteps, John Baker enlisted and qualified as a Navy SEAL. He saw action in Operation Condor as a scout sniper. Operation Condor was a United States-backed campaign of political oppression involving intelligence operations and assassination of opponents. His temper never bothered Adler, who recruited him to help hunt down Perseus. Born on March 20th, 1930, Frank Woods has been a diet-in-the-wool rebel ever since his early years. He ran away from his Philadelphia home as a young child, never to return to the life he once knew. Getting by on his street smarts and razor sharp instincts, Woods quickly learned to depend on no one but himself for survival. After enlisting in the United States Marine Corps, Woods gained an extensive amount of fighting experience throughout the Korean War and afterwards became a sergeant in the MACV SOG during the Vietnam War. One can only imagine the reputation he earned in combat, which eventually led him to joining the CIA Special Activities Division. Helen Park entered Oxford at the young age of 16, while working on her doctorate in international relations. Her older brother was severely injured in an Irish Republic Army or IRA car bomb attack in London, leading her to immediately drop out of the program. She began to study the origins and motivations of international paramilitary organizations, eventually leading her to join the ranks of the Secret Intelligence Service or MI6. After several years of international assignments, Park was placed on protection service for two British scientists. Under Park's watch, the team was set to travel to a clandestine location to collaborate with the CIA on an officially sponsored project. There she met Adler, a key figure in the new program, and personally took on an expanded role in its development. Afterwards, she would join Adler on an ad hoc black operations team utilizing the fruits of their labor together. However, the interests of MI6 and the Crown always come first for Park, whether her new partners know it or not. Jay Hunter is the first generation of his family born on United States soil. His father served as a translator for United States forces during the Korean War, and Hunter enlisted in the army in 1977, after which he volunteered and passed selection for the United States Army Rangers in 1979. Lawrence Sims was born on February 4th, 1942 at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. After the loss of his father, he developed a laid-back and lightly sarcastic persona, studying the world with detached amusement. Sims quickly immersed himself in the world of technology, both military and consumer, quietly focusing on following in his father's footsteps. After receiving a scholarship and graduating from Rochester Institute of Technology, Sims entered the United States Army, where he served for two years before joining the CIA. There, he quickly became known for his keen intelligence, pragmatism and abilities to solve intractable problems. In a twist of fate, his first major assignment was a placement on Russell Adler's MACV SOG team in Vietnam, where he immediately became one of Adler's favorite cohorts. Sims has continued to be a constant presence on Adler's team ever since, including the fateful operation that would bring him face to face with Alex Mason and Frank Woods. 
Kay Song is a counter-terrorism expert and member of the White Tiger 707 Special Mission Group of the Republic of Korea Army Special Warfare Command or ROKSWC, quite a mouthful. She's an expert in scuba and air assault operations. An expert in demolitions and bomb disposal, Ingo Beck, is a tactical operator serving in the Dienst Einheit 9 or Surface Group 9. Being calm and dependable, he diffuses tense situations with the dry humor of someone who regularly handles explosives. Growing up on the streets of Cuba before joining a pro-revolutionary street gang, Mendo Garcia is a ruthless assassin employed by the DGI or Direction General de Inteligencia, the counterpart of the CIA. Sorry if I butchered that. A child mathematical genius, Irina Portnova worked in cryptography before being inducted into the KGB Directorate V, a part of the Spetsnaz. Brilliant, deadly and fanatically loyal to the state, she represents a threat either on or off the battlefield. Former Marine Lieutenant Jay Powers was accused of being a foreign agent and fled to the USSR. It remains plausible that the CIA may have engineered the scenario attempting to embed her within the Soviet intelligence apparatus. Member of the 22nd SES Special Projects team, Larry Stone is trained in hostage rescue and close quarters battle tactics. He was dishonorably discharged, after which he became a mercenary selling his skills to the highest bidder. His service records remain classified. Interestingly, Stone's outfit matches that of Bell in multiple operations across the campaign with the balaclava and gloves, navy blue coat and singular knee pad on his right knee. One difference is that Bell was wearing a black balaclava, watching the flashback from Nowhere Left to Run, where Arash Kafidar shoots Bell. We can see he is wearing a mask similar to Stone. Obviously, assuming the American ending is the canon ending, Adler betrays Bell and possibly kills him. The reason I'm assuming Adler won the duel is because Adler is one of the operators in multiplayer set in 1983, two years after the events of the campaign. Still, even losing that fight, Bell could have survived that encounter as he did once before and assumed a new identity. Him joining the Warsaw Pact, being part of the alliance opposing Adler, adds to this hypothesis. Of course, this is all speculation, as it easily could have been the same model they used. Trained in the jungle and anti-narco operations in the National Army of Colombia, Eth Vargas joined the M19 guerrilla group to fight against a government he considered corrupt and the cartels he believed to be pulling their strings. Thank you guys very much for watching. The creation of these videos is very time consuming from writing a script to designing the motion graphics. If you like these types of videos and want to support me in continuing creating, there are several things you can do. Liking or disliking, depending on what you thought of the video. Other than views, this shows me how much you like the content I put out. Subscribing reinforces your support and shows me you want more videos. Leaving interactive comments or feedback reminds me how I'm not just doing it for myself and shows how I can improve. And the last way to support me is to join the channel and become a member for one, five or ten dollars. Other than badges and emojis, I haven't created rewards yet, but I'm always open to suggestions. With that in mind, I want to say thanks to Hidden Fox Style, Khalil Cheeks and Nervous Rekt for being members of the channel. You guys are awesome. The more support I gain, the time and energy I can invest in YouTube and in turn this will result in more frequent uploads and higher quality content. Whatever you decide to do, I'll be here because I like what I do. Thanks again for watching, peace out.